back. We are turning the spotlight on a couple of uh, very interesting companies now. The Biocon stock actually has been under the weather of late. It's actually lost 25% so far this year, but there's a lot happening within the company. In fact, its uh, biologics facility recently got the approval from the, uh, the EU regulator. The GMP certificate came through, of, um, and of course, uh, there is a big pipeline ahead in the biosimilars portfolio that the market seems quite excited about. We have with us uh, Ms. Kiran Mazumdar Shaw, Chairman and Managing Director of Biocoin, joining in to talk about how perhaps this year uh, is going to shape up for the company. Ms. Shaw, thank you so much for taking out the time and joining in. You know, biosimilars has been a fantastic story for the company. Your revenues doubled over the last uh, one year or so. And I was looking at some projections, ma'am. One of these reports said that by FY21, perhaps, the revenue from this business could be as high as 370 to $400 million. Now, I don't know, are these uh, uh, very optimistic, overly optimistic projections, or are these doable numbers for you? I think these are very, very realistic numbers because if you look at the opportunity for biosimilars in the targeted markets, especially the US and European markets, we believe that this is a very realistic uh, number which we can definitely deliver on. Because if you think about the projections of the biosimilars market, which in 2018, uh, in the US and Europe alone was $2.9 billion and is projected to increase to almost $14 billion by 2025, in which I think the portfolio that Mylan and Biocon is addressing is a substantial part of this $14 billion opportunity. And this does not include really the insulin's portfolio that we also have. So considering that, I think we have a very realistic target and I'm hopeful that we can actually beat this estimate. Oh, wow, that's uh, very nice to hear. Misha, uh, good morning. This is Sonia here. I, I will come back to the business in a bit, but before that, uh, I wanted your views on what's happening with respect to the whole, you know, um, the, the United States getting tougher as far as regulatory reforms are concerned. India has just, you know, raised tariffs on a few products, but do you think that there is a risk of an escalation in some of these trade issues with the U.S.? And would it have any impact at all on the industry? Well, you know, I just feel that the generic industry and now the uh, biopharmaceutical industry through biosimilars is actually uh, helping to keep costs down in the U.S. in terms of its own challenge with spiraling healthcare costs. So I hope that this is a sector that won't be severely impacted compared to other sectors which are non-critical for them. So I believe that this is a sector that India must actually focus on in terms of building a very strong rationale for why tariffs should not be basically, uh, you know, uh, imposed on this particular sector. So personally, I believe that this is a sector that is a win-win for both economies. Okay. Uh, Ma'am, so just to come back to the business then, uh, all things being equal, if we don't have some outlier event in the form of tariffs or protectionist measures, um, just to get back to the uh, sort of numbers that we were discussing, uh, can you give us some uh, you know, more color on the way the rollout uh, is going to happen and how some of the key drugs, for instance, uh, Pegfil, uh, Pegfilgrastim, Trastuzumab, how will some of these key products do for you in the big markets that's the EU and the US, and what is the, the rest of the launch pipeline looking like for this year? Sure. So as you know, in, the U, in Europe alone, we have already four biosimilars approved and in the market uh, between Mylan and Biocon. And I think uh, these are early days yet, but we are very uh, you know, uh, optimistic that even Europe is going to be a very important uh, market growth opportunity for Biocon. But of course, uh, we are all the eyes are focused on the US opportunity, which really is a very large opportunity for both companies. As you know, in a very short time, we have actually garnered a, you know, over 20% market share in Pegfil Grastim which I think demonstrates how good uh, this entry has been for uh, our product uh, Fulfiller or Pegfil Grastim in the U.S. market. 
and obviously we do have now competition from Coherus and probably a few others. But having said that, I think we are very uh, confident that uh, in the year ahead, we would be able to basically add to this uh, growth number because we do need to basically uh, enhance certain capacity requirements in order to really uh, compete aggressively in the marketplace. Uh, when it comes to uh, uh, our Trastuzumab, uh, you know, we are seeing that uh, we are, the launch is fairly uh, imminent. We are already in, the, in Europe. Uh, we've just entered the European markets in a few key markets and we are seeing a good response to this particular launch. And I think you will see some good uptick in the, in the, in the quarters ahead. But I think U.S. is going to be a big launch opportunity for Biocon and Mylan. And I believe Trastuzumab is going to uh, be a very big opportunity, which we are really, really focused on making it into a success. Followed by that is, of course, going to be the insulin glargine in the U.S. market. Uh, hopefully, we should be in the market uh, sometime next year. So all in all, I think our... Uh, you know, early uh, pipeline of uh, biosimilars have been launched, are being launched and will actually uh, deliver on the promise that uh, they held for us. Having said that, we also have a, a, a pipeline following that, which includes Bevacizumab, which, as you know, has completed phase three clinical trials. And we hope to get approval for Bevacizumab in the coming future. And beyond that, of course, we also have insulin as part. And then we have other products in the pipeline. Uh, so you can see how seriously committed we are to biosimilars. And we believe we have the most comprehensive, uh, you know, portfolio of biosimilars for the coming years. Apart from biosimilars, the other standout performance was the growth that you saw in your research uh, segment, which is your Syngene business. In the year gone by, it was uh, research services were up almost 30%. Uh, what's the outlook like for FY20? What would be the triggers there? I think the outlook for the year ahead is as uh, promising because we believe that uh, research services now is beginning to really uh, you know, deliver on its integrated uh, platform, which I think is becoming very attractive to many, many uh, big pharma companies uh, and other non-pharma companies. And now given the kind of, uh, you know, uh, tension that arises, be arises between China and US, I think we are seeing more and more uh, focus on opportunities that they can actually leverage from economies like India. So I think that's something which we really want to focus on. We are also giving, uh, you know, we are also focusing on some very new age and new emerging technologies based on uh, digital technologies, based on, uh, you know, the um, data analytics kind of services, as well as, of course, this whole new area of cell therapies. And uh, I think that's going to be a very, very important uh, biologics uh, focus area for uh, Sinjin. Okay, all right, uh, Mishra. Thank you very much for joining us with some more uh, color and uh, some more details on those projections. We wish you luck with that business. All right, on that note, we do have to move on to certain other parts of the market as well. The equity market, of course, continues to be deep in the red this morning. Let's find out what is happening in the world of commodities. We have Manisha back with us. Good morning, Manisha. Morning, Sirvi, and thank you for that. Well, we have seen marginal gains actually continue in many of the commodities, starting with the crude oil prices, and last week was a good one, especially on the concerns from what Iran is uh, uh, retaliating with, and a couple of tankers being attacked at Strait of Hormuz. So that really added to the premium on prices. But we haven't seen a runaway rally since that knee-jerk reaction, and that's because there are demand concerns as per reports from EIA and IEA, both those international energy agencies. And then you also are looking at the U.S. inventory at the highest since July 2017. The major area of focus, of course, is going to be the OPEC meeting now slated for the first week of July. The expected dates are 3rd to 4th of July and uh, the, the consensus, uh, the output expectation from OPEC and Russia is what will really give you the direction for the crude oil prices going forward from here. 
The gold and silver prices in the meanwhile have been trading quite firm as well. We did see gold prices in the global markets hit a 14-month highs of around $13.62 per ounce. It's holding around $13.40 at this point in time. Some profit taking because of US dollar, which is trading at a two-week highs right now. But the Indian markets clearly outperforming themselves. $33,000 is holding for gold and $37,000 for silver as well. The markets also are watching out for the US dollar, the weakness in Chinese data, uh, the concerns that you also have seen in the global trade scenario, those are few of the factors that have led to safe haven buying in case of precious metals. The industrial metals in the meanwhile have been quite choppy. We have seen the steel prices decline by 2% today. This is after reports that steel production in China has gained up by 10% in this year. But the other non-ferrous metals have done well. Copper especially because there are uh, employee or wage issues in mines in Chile and that has been supportive. Aluminum has seen some decline in inventories and that has been supportive. Nickel prices are trading at a two-week highs even as steel and iron ore prices have seen some profit taking today. And that is because there are flooding instances in Indonesia and that has halted mine operations. So supply concerns coming out of Indonesia, which is the biggest producer of nickel, has led to support there. So that really seems to be rubbing off across the sector. So while ferrous metals are not doing so good, the non-ferrous metals continue to inch up in the trade today. Trading strategies and we have buy calls in the precious metal prices from KDIA. In case of gold, 33,350 is the level that they are watching out for. In silver as well, the buying call continues. 37,450 should be on your radar today. Okay, thanks a lot for that. It's getting worse for the markets now. So more than 200 points gone on the Sensex and the Nifty is down over 70 odd points and not looking like a good day at all for the bulls that is. We'll take a break. Up next, we'll find out what's happening with uh, a whole host of issues in the banking sector, the recent guidelines on bad asset resolution.